Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy, where today we will look at Jacksonian democracy and the rise of Andrew Jackson in our series, The Age of Jackson. In previous lessons, we were introduced to Jackson during the War of 1812, fighting Native Americans at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and the British at the Battle of New Orleans. We witnessed the downfall of the Federalist Party, who came out of the war looking unpatriotic and looked at a changing America as slavery and cotton farming was one of many factors driving Americans westward in search of new lands. And that debate about where slavery should be allowed in the lands acquired during the Louisiana Purchase boiled over with the Missouri Compromise. And slavery wasn't the only issue creating a divide between the North and South as Northern manufacturing and financial interests were pouring over into the political arena. So what do you need to know for today's lesson? Today we are going to introduce the concept of Jacksonian democracy and the growth of suffrage or the right to vote. And just a reminder, teachers at this lesson plan with a variety of resources that are available at Teachers Pay Teachers, just click the link below this video or search for Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teachers Pay Teachers. In our previous lesson, we discussed the themes of the age of Jackson and we covered the beginnings of westward expansion and the rise of sectionalism. And today we'll look at the change in political elections with, again, what is known as Jacksonian democracy. Jacksonian democracy is described as a shift from political rule by the often wealthy elite, which many of the founding fathers were, as to something more resembling rule by the people. And we'll also look at the rise and legend of Andrew Jackson, who came to symbolize this changing political landscape. So who was Andrew Jackson? Well, to most Americans at the time, Andrew Jackson was, again, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans from the War of 1812. But there's more to the story of why so many Americans would come to identify with him. Andrew Jackson, who was born in a log cabin, had a difficult childhood. His father died early in his life, and Jackson, who grew up in the South, witnessed political tyranny at a young age. Jackson volunteered in a militia during the Revolutionary War when he was only just 13. After being captured, he was struck with a sword by a British officer when he refused to polish his boots. Jackson lost his brothers and mother during the war, leaving him an orphan at the age of 15. Jackson eventually moved to the rough western territory of Tennessee, where with determination and hard work, he became a successful lawyer and a leader of the local militia. Known as having a temper, Jackson is believed to have fought in several duels. However, only one resulted in shots fired in which he killed a man named Charles Dickinson, whom he accused of cheating on a horse bet. It should be pointed out that dueling, especially in the South, was a fairly accepted way to settle disputes of one's honor. Jackson would take his role as militia leader to new heights in the American military. Again, providing him with national fame and sometimes notoriety for the wrong reasons. Following the War of 1812, tensions had risen with Spain over Florida, which was a refuge for slaves and Creek Indians. The two groups united, calling themselves the Seminoles, which means runaway. And in 1818, then General Andrew Jackson was sent south to stop the raids of the Seminoles into Georgia. Jackson took it upon himself without orders to raid Florida, seizing western parts of the state and kicking off a series of conflicts in the area of what would be called the Seminole Wars. Despite the outrage of Spain, they would go on to cede Florida to the United States in 1819. In a previous lesson, we also learned about the rise of sectionalism, in which different regions began to look out for their own local interests. From 1816 to 1824, the U.S. had only one major political party, the Democratic Republicans, in what is known as the Era of Good Feelings. In 1824, four candidates representing the party ran for the presidency, William Crawford, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, and John Quincy Adams. Clay and Jackson represented the new emerging West, 
Crawford, the traditional South, and Adams, the Northeast. Jackson, who had been raised in poverty, claimed to speak for Americans who had been left out of the political process. In the early Republic, often only white men who owned property were allowed to vote in most states. Jackson received the largest share of the vote, but no candidate won a majority of the Electoral College votes, sending the election to the House of Representatives to decide the winner, as stated in the Constitution. Henry Clay, who had come in last in the electoral vote, met with Adams and agreed to give him his support. As Speaker of the House of Representatives, it is believed that Clay convinced the Congress to give the vote to Adams in exchange for being named Secretary of State. This deal became known as the Corrupt Bargain. Although no evidence ever proved the Corrupt Bargain took place, the scandal tainted Adams' presidency. Most of his proposals for internal improvements to roads and canals and the building of a national university were denied by the Congress. The corrupt bargain infuriated Jackson and his supporters, and almost immediately he planned his campaign to defeat Adams in 1828. By the time of the election, the Democratic-Republican Party had split with supporters of Jackson calling themselves the Democrats. Jackson was seen as the quote-unquote common man's candidate. Meanwhile, supporters for Adams called themselves National Republicans, and these were often northern merchants and businessmen who supported the internal improvements. The election of 1828 was different than any previous campaign. Both used slogans and rallies and campaign buttons, establishing the tradition of modern campaigns as we know them today. Both campaigns also carried out quote-unquote mudslinging, or the practice of using insults and sometimes false rumors to ruin their opponent's reputation. The Adams campaign accused Jackson of being a murderer and an adulterer, attacking his wife Rachel, who was still legally married during their first two years as husband and wife. The Jackson campaign, meanwhile, accused Adams of providing a young girl to a Russian minister and stocking the White House with gambling devices at the taxpayer's expense. Turned out to be a billiards table and chess boards paid for by Adams, but... The tradition of organized campaigns and mudslinging, or what we call today attack ads, continues to be a big part of modern elections and can be traced back to this election of 1828. Jackson won the election handily, carrying all of the western frontier and southern states who were big supporters of states' rights and powers when it comes to governing. Jackson also benefited from his vice presidential candidate, John C. Calhoun, a southerner who had served as Adams VP but switched allegiances to run with Jackson. Jackson was a new breed of president. He was a self-made man and spoke out for those who had been left out of the political process. Although by 1828, most states had dropped property-owning requirements for voting, the election of Jackson symbolized the shift in which all white men could now vote. Thousands poured into Washington to attend Jackson's inauguration, as well as a party hosted at the White House afterward. The party apparently got out of hand as an intoxicated crowd trashed the White House. The election of Jackson symbolized a shift in political participation and changed elections forever. While it would take a long time for African Americans and women to join the political process, Jacksonian democracy, or the idea that the government would no longer be controlled by the wealthy elite, would change American politics forever. So what would Jackson do with his new role as the quote-unquote people's president? That's what we'll look at next time with his Native American policies, the nullification battle with southern states, and more. But first, let's review. Jacksonian democracy was seen as a shift from rule by the blank to rule by the blank. Rule by the elite to rule by the people. Jackson became a national hero after winning this battle in the War of 1812, we know this one, the Battle of New Orleans. Jackson has a reputation for fighting in many of these duels. Where did Jackson invade in search of Native Americans and runaway slaves? Florida. 
These raids helped push this country to sell Florida to the United States. Spain. How many people ran for the election of 1824? Four. Despite Jackson getting the most votes, who won the election of 1824? John Quincy Adams. In the early years of the Republic, what was often a requirement to vote? Property ownership. Because no candidate held the majority, who decided the election of 1824? The House of Representatives. Which Speaker of the House supposedly swung the election to Adams? Henry Clay. This supposed deal between Clay and Adams was known as the corrupt bargain. The election of 1828 is known for ugly political tactics and accusations called mudslinging. This Adams VP switched his allegiance to run with Jackson in 1828. John C. Calhoun. Where did Jackson have most of his support in his victory in 1828? In the western frontier states and the southern states. After property requirements were dropped, who still could not vote? Women and African Americans. And that's it. I want to thank you guys for watching. Be sure to subscribe because up next we are going to look at Jackson's presidency. And just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint with worksheets, smart board activities, cahoots, lesson plans, quizzes, guided notes, and additional activities are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just click the link in the notes below this video or search for Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teachers Pay Teachers. Again, guys, keep up that good work and you're going to ace that exam.